Let me introduce you next presenter. Next presenter is Professor Thomas Krilavichus. He is Dean of the Faculty of Informatics uh, in Vitotas Magnus University, a specialist in artificial intelligence and language applications. He is also currently a member of the Information Technology Section of NATO STO and a member of Clarin Eric Center's committee. He has extensive experience in business, in companies such as Equinox Europe, ELSIS, ElitNet, et cetera, and in the academic field. He also worked and managed international and Lithuanian applied and fundamental research projects. Topics of his presentation is OSINT and text analytics, what is hidden in plain sign. So please, Thomas, start. So today I'm going to talk about open source intelligence and text analytics and basically what you can extract from these things. So let me introduce myself shortly. So first of all, of course, thank you, Vito, just for introduction, but I'm not going to repeat these things. I just wanted to show that basically what I'm going to talk mostly it relates with my personal experience. And I have both experience in industry and academia, and also applications of research results and probably practical stuff in military domain as well, and a bit on in other security related domain, etc. So basically, what I'm going to talk mostly about what I saw people doing or where I was involved myself and what kind of solutions you can try to develop in this area. So first of all, about open source intelligence. So of course, when you start talking about intelligence, especially you know, military intelligence level, usually you imagine, you know, you can remember all these action movies, for example, Bond, Agent 007 and stuff like that. But today, intelligence is quite different. So, of course, you have agents who participate in field operations. But really, a huge part of intelligence may look like this. Of course, probably, if you have really secret operations, you don't have such big windows in your office, but actually team working on some specific intelligence task or especially open source intelligence, it may look like this actually in reality. So just uh, people using computers to extract some information, to analyze it and get some insights. And that's related mostly with you no know, usual thing, but it, it's getting even more common these times so that data has a better idea. So basically, if you can extract data, if you can find it, you can analyze it, of course, you can check, you can verify it, then you can use it to make your decisions. And this type of application, it's getting common, of course, not only in military intelligence or in business operations, but everywhere. And in, in this case, I'm going to talk about open source intelligence. So first of, of, of all, of course, it would be interesting to talk about sources of information. And when it comes to sources, actually, in intelligence, of course, you can have very different sources. So in these presentations, mostly, I'm going to talk about OSINT, open source intelligence. But you can have imagery intelligence, which actually it may be in some cases the same as open source intelligence. So basically, if you get image from open source, it can be analyzed both in both areas. And actually, sometimes it poses some questions, especially if you have separate teams working on different types of intelligence. And then at some moment, you combine this information so if accidentally both teams have used the same image to get some explanations or some insights, it may seem that actually you get things from two sources. And actually, this, these things happen in reality, so in real applications. But so that's one of the issues of work organization 
but still you have these things. Then, of course, you have human intelligence. So that's basically the part where you have agents. And I cannot really comment on that because I don't know about these things, how it works in reality. But usually, as far as I know, it's not as interesting as in movies. It's just talking with people, maybe, you know, smoking and some cigarettes with them or something like that and getting stuff, getting to know some stuff, writing some reports. Then she is cybent, cyber intelligence. So basically, in this case, of course, some part are things which you can get using open source intelligence tools. So again, you have, you know, some joint coverage. And then other part, of course, it's maybe, you know, hacking in some systems or getting access to the systems which are you, which you are not supposed to access. Signals intelligence. So basically it could be different signals, radio, thermal, some satellite imagery, in, et cetera. And of course, you can have different types of intelligences. But what we are going to talk and what I'm talking today about is open source intelligence. And that means basically everything you can find online without you know, breaking in, or I would say in some cases probably is soft breaking in, not some hardcore stuff. And the figure, actually, I took this figure from Open Source Intelligence Framework website. There you can actually interactively analyze, you know, some classifier and look at what kind of information you can get and what kind of tools you can find. Of course, some of them work, some of them don't, but still you can find different tools which can be used for different analysis and for collecting data from different sources. And I would like to discuss some sources. So as I said, in the end, the main source is internet, uh, including World Wide Web. So mostly it's World Wide Web, but as you know, internet is the whole infrastructure. So basically, if you can still able to find some FTP or secure FTP, access points or something else, you can use them, of course, to get the data you are interested in. And one of the main sources when it comes to open source data are media portals. And just to show, actually, I was trying to use sources which mostly, which are mostly relate, related with me. So I do not you know, have to avoid talking about other people in this case. So for example, here you can see what kind of information you can access about me and our TLT portal. So it's one of media main media portals in Lithuania. And another part is just image search on Google while putting my first and last name. So it easily shows that actually you can be quite exposed in different years. And what kind of info you can extract from such sources. So when it comes, yeah, so multimedia portals, it, it depends on how much media writes about you. But usually you can find quite a lot of personal information, especially if you are, you know, person who is interesting for media, or probably if you are politically exposed person, so politician, et cetera, media writes a lot about you and then you can, they can find information about your biography, your family, your relatives, of course, your business interests, different relations with different people, so sometimes it's, you know, correct information, sometimes it's incorrect, but still a lot of info. And of course, if you participate in different events, they can easily find a lot of photos of you. And of course, when it comes to celebrities or politicians, again, sometimes it's the same. Again, you can find information about different 
properties like real estate, cars owned by these politicians, or just people which are interested. So, of course, as always, you would have to verify this information. But basically, if you can collect data from media portals, it means that using language technology tools, so usually you, have, you will have to use the whole NLP pipeline from text preprocessing, duplicates removal to named entities, identification, and then you know, building some structures, filling some data structures with specific data about person, you can extract quite a lot of interesting information. Of course, some of it may be incorrect, but you can do it relatively cheaply. So actually, in most of the cases, you can use even open source tools. So for data scrapping, and just using, you know, some, for example, Python and Spacey library for named entity recognition and in general text processing. So, and it, it works actually in most of the interesting languages as well. So in, in our case, for example, Russian, Lithuanian, and English, you have tools for these things already. Then, of course, forms. And that's a bit different information. And I have some screenshots from different forums. And for, so actually, two forums are in Lithuania, and some of them probably you know. So for example, Super Mamalta. So basically, mother's kind of forum. You can find a lot of information. Of course, some people hide behind some nicknames there. But actually, if you are able to extract information and to find interesting information there, then probably cyber people can help you to identify these people if you think that we are discussing topics which are not good to discuss or maybe which you want to follow up. And again, info, you can find very different info. So business is info. Basically, in such forums, you have some you may have salespeople or people who, you know, trying to get some info, advertise something, and they provide info about some businesses as well. And actually, forums or some uh, ads portals, they are very good source to identify maybe people which probably are interested for tax office or maybe police as well. So related, for example, with uh, non-paying taxes, etc. And of course, you can have hackers forums. Of course, you are not going to get really deep and interesting information there. But if you have proper tools, for example, to follow discussions on different hacking tools, and you see some growing popularity, you can expect some, you know, beginning hackers just to try to experiment with them and perform some not really intentional or kind of, you know, playing style attacks on some infrastructure as well in some cases. So all these channels are also very interesting source. And info, again, you can find very diverse info there. Well, social media. So probably you know, you, most of you probably use in one way or another social media. And actually that's perfect source for different intelligence information. And of course, you can gather very different information from different sources. Sometimes it's not so easy to extract. And for example, on, on this slide, I share some screenshots from Facebook, LinkedIn, Contact, yeah, and Instagram. And of course, you can have, find very different info there. While Facebook is a very good tool, actually, to get a lot of personal info, some contacts, networks, actually, to see where somebody is traveling with whom 
this person is communicating when the LinkedIn is more business contacts, business history, personal profiles. Contacted, basically, it's a Russian version of Facebook and it's quite popular. Of course, not in Lithuania, but for example, if you have proper tools, it's very good source, at least it used to be very good source for, for example, Baltic states intelligence to follow what's happening in Russia. And there are some cases where you can extract even, you know, movement of some military units because, as, of course, things are changing and they are closing these things, but I mean, I saw some examples where you can see, you know, how somebody from military unit is posting something and you get location and you, you can see how this person is moving around in Russia, for example, moving to Ukrainian border or even Ukraine or maybe Estonian border, etc. So these are perfect sources, of course. And I mean, very different tools can be used for that. Of course, after Cambridge Analytics, scandal, it get, you know, all these portals, they are trying to close access to their data. But for, man, from other side, you have quite a few tools that can access this data. And then for some data, of course, you can have to do some mix. So probably you have to infiltrate some humans, you know, to collect this information from specific pages. So I will show you some example and discuss it later on. So basically, when it comes to OSINT, it means that any type of data you can access online is the data you can use to get some insights. And as I, I have already mentioned, media portals and actually comment sections are very interesting because from comment sections, especially if you can identify specific people, you can I already you know build their profiles or even if you are not able to identify people, you can identify some information attack vectors, probably identify new growing vectors. So it could be media portals, comments, discussions in social media. Then we have something which, I mean, is really nice things to have, different open data sources, and of course, these are great sources to build new businesses, find new business opportunities. But at the same time, these are very good open source intelligence channels. So if you have you know, data about social situation in different places of Lithuania, and you are planning some information attacks, you know how to tune them in different regions. If you see some business information, for example, from register center data. Again, you can tune, you know, use different access to these people. And then of course you have some, you know, forums data, which we have discussed already. Then of course you can find some unprotected storage. So I think you have heard it. Of course it's more cyber side finding these things, but at the same time, it's kind of open source data if it's open. And then of course you have different leaks, so we will shortly discuss these leaks as well. And then I want to discuss some specific cases actually to show how this information can be used. So one of the cases is probably less military intelligence and more financial crime intelligence level. So we did some with, with, with my colleagues from Vitautas Magnus University, with informatics, Faculty of Informatics, we did some analysis of combining different offshore leaks databases. So Pandora, Bahamas, Panama, offshore leaks. So all basically open offshore leaks combined with open uh, center of register data or data accessible from requisite ELPA. And it was quite big team actually. So 
both computer science, mathematics, and linguists. And just an example from what you can get in for uh, just screenshots. So it's in Lithuanian, but basically the idea is that if you can identify specific people, you can identify the relation of these people with other companies. And here is just a list of some person, let's say named Arturas, and how he relates with a number of different companies. And then of course you can delve deeper if you want to analyze type of relation, level of involvement. And then of course you can look at these things from different sides. So you can look at specific organization and with what people and probably with change of time, this person is related. So, and then of course, geographical view. So these are, for example, Pandora box papers and they're just number of offshore companies in different Lithuanian locations. And here it's, these are again, this, uh, you know, person nicknamed Arturas companies and network of the same person, Arturas. So number of different companies and relations, direct and indirect. So of course, in this case, probably most of these things are legal. And I'm not talking about detecting some illegal activities here, but what could be interesting in the first step is identifying different networks. And then based on this network's result, probably at some moment you can either identify some illegal activities or just interesting activities or just to understand, you know, influence of some people on what's happening on. And based on these relations, you can say, well, is it, you know, the regular information campaign or as campaign or actually some you no know, people which seem unrelated if we are talking the same stuff, probably they are related. It's just not visible directly. So in this analysis of short papers, we have discussed it with our financial crime services. And actually we were quite happy to see the, way, the things you can extract from this info. Of course, if you are a specific governmental agency, you can you have access to information which is not open source. So of course, if you combine information they have with open source information, you can get even a lot more interesting things as well. Then another small research, so it was done quite a long time ago, uh, but what you can do, you can analyze information flow in different media as well. And here is example of the different rad radical information media because it was done eight years ago. I'm not going to go too much into details, but basically what you can do, you can look at different topics that people are discussing in these different channels. Then you can look at the references. So let's say who cites whom, so you can see timeline and then from such analysis, basically, you can identify who was, you know, the first person to publish or to start some narratives. And basically, these were most about these issues in Garleva with pedophile scandal when it was uh, uh, discussion about selling Lithuanian land to foreigners and stuff like that. So a lot of specific topics which were interesting, like eight years ago or something like that. Or And as I said, basically you can identify information flow. So there are some narrative starts, how distributes, then of course you can identify some center person. So basically social networks analysis or network analysis tools. And that may help you know to see actually who is building narratives which are posed against your country or against specific company or just a specific idea and see how it grows, how it evolves, who are central people who are, you know, just probably not 
some bystanders or participants at actually how these different topics and ideas relate. Then one more example, so analysis of radical groups on Facebook. So that was the you no know, research where somebody had to infiltrate two specific groups and then to collect the data from these groups. So several radical groups on Facebook were analyzed. And unfortunately, you cannot do these things anymore because the APIs which we have used are already closed. You cannot download this in for these days. But basically, the analysis was so several different types of groups were analyzed. So basically, groups were discussions were anti NATO, anti Western, some xenophobia. Very strong criticism of democracy and in some cases pro Russian ideology as well. And we looked actually what kind of topics are discussed there and what is done with these things. So, number of posts, so quite a few members actually, and two types of groups, so pro Russian and other radical groups. So some of them can be very nationalistic. And actually, it's several years old research. So groups were, we, we had investigated groups were, which were, were started like 10 or five to 10 years ago. So quite a few posts and some interesting insights. So actually, some mainly discussions, so most common words and ideas, so basically pro-Russian, Lithuanian, pro-Russian radical right groups, which sounds a bit strange, but we had such type of groups. So basically, most talk, mostly topics were anti-Lithuanian government, anti-NATO, anti-European Union, anti-immigration, especially anti-immigration was growing all the time. And then main topics were, you know, Russia, USA, influence of USA on Lithuanian government, influence of European Union of, on information government. Is it good to be NATO or should be independent and stuff like that? And actually, other radical right, it's more, you know, the land purchase, non lt citizens, anti-European Union, but with support of NATO. But actually, you have quite a few common topics there. And some dynamics of the groups. So I'm not here, you know, to discuss the specific topics, just to give you insight what you can extract from these groups. So I'm not going deeply into analysis, but basically the idea is what we are, we are able to identify actually that these groups were growing all the time. So first of all, most of the groups 10 years ago started moving to Facebook. Now actually it's not clear whether they are still there or they have moved somewhere else. But then actually you can see that you have always some narratives which are growing and which are inserted in these groups. So basically it, it was changing, but actually, you know, it's always possible to, to find narrative. Of course, today it's mostly coded, so it's not interesting anymore, but the topics were changing all the time. And of course, you can see correlations with events. So for example, when it comes to old times, so Ukraine, of course, became very strong topic than Syrian war. Today, again, it would be something else. So probably, it, of course, these days it's COVID and Ukrainian conflict. But basically what you can see, and you can make some you know, conclusions about it that the groups follow what's happening there. And actually, what was interesting to see as well, that you have quite big mix. So for example, 21% of pro-Russian Facebook groups, most of them are closed groups, belong to 
Lithuanian nationalist groups as well. So one fifth, so each fifth person is in both groups. And of course, you can, you know, see it differently because sometimes it just could be the case that, you know, they try and filtrate each other groups just to see what's happening there. But actually, what's strange, they have quite a few common ideas. So both pro-Russian and nationalist groups, for example, they think that European Union is bad thing, immigration is bad thing, and both of them think that, you know, dictatorship is not such a bad idea and stuff like that. And then one more example. So basically, Ukraine increases crisis in 2013, 2014. And we looked at narrative analysis. So we split it into three stages and looked actually how discussion changes. And we looked at three different sources. So BBC, Russia Today, Day Kiev, and Delphi LP. And looked how actually it changes. So I'm not going back to these details. It's just different topics, but basically three stages of a conflict. First stage, and how different sources are discussing it. So basically, Russia today and the Kiev in the beginning of the conflict, they were using the same, you know, rhetorics to discuss things. The BBC was somewhere in the middle. Uh, as usual, Lithuanian sources, Delphi LT, were strongly anti-Russian, mostly, you know, pro-freedom, pro-NATO, etc., but in support of Ukraine. Then, actually, second stage. So we had some escalation of conflict. Yanukovych has resigned, etc., etc. And what you have actually way of discussing things is changing strongly. So actually, they, Kiev and Russia today, they are still talking about brotherhood and fraternity, but you get quite a lot of criticism on Russia's involvement in this conflict. And they, Kiev is moving further. So you have four different ways of discussing the same topic. And then, basically Crimean occupation. And of course, you see what you could expect. The Kiev is talking about the conflict almost in the same way as Delphi LP. BBC is still somewhere in the middle and Russia today is on different side. And there is no more brotherhood or fraternity or whatever between uh, two Slavic countries. They see things different. And Ukraine has moved to completely different view on what's happening there. In BBC, you still have mixed discussions. Uh, and for sure, if you look at how you know today's conflict is discussed in BBC, you could still find quite a few people who kind of support Russia's interest in the Baltic states and in Ukraine. But you can see how these things change. And basically, this analysis can show actually how different events, different announcements, different behaviors may change rhetorics in uh, different areas. And just shortly, actually, you can follow sentiment as well there. So basically, you can follow mood of people and see how different events and different reactions, you know, affect them. And these are just to exemplify what kind of results you can get from such analysis. Basically, then different analysts can use to make decisions based on that. And just shortly, one slide, slide on one project which we are working right now. So we hate speech detection, we hate free fraud. So quite a big team again mix of uh, computer scientists and linguists. And the idea here is to identify hate speech and select this hate speech to allow you know, to different portals to deal with it. 
it doesn't sound as some deep intelligence, but actually you can identify again specific groups or specific narratives which are growing somewhere or which are supported by different number of people. And to summarize, so basically open source intelligence and text analytics. So from one hand, situation is changing. So basically you get different regulations and tools which could help you hide information about yourself. So GDPR, data protection regulations, which are actually quite an issue, both from um, you know freelance, open source intelligence people, but also for some intelligence people who are doing research. Then of course you have use VPNs to hide some information. Maybe it's more on cyber side. You can use specific emails like Tutanote or ProtonMail, which are kind of encoded. Then of course you have dark web, deep web, where you can hide things as well. But still in the end, what you get, you get a lot of media, which is still open. You get social networks where using tools kind of from gray zone, you can collect information. And mostly what people can found, find about you, you provide this information yourself usually by you know building your social media profiles or talking about these things, or maybe just, you know, by participating in this event, I provide already a lot of info about myself. So my photo will be somewhere, my profile will be accessible for, for quite a few people, you know, and you actually will have these slides. It's, it will be in YouTube. So the topics I'm looking at will be visible for different people. So it's quite a lot. And actually, it would be hard to remove this information from all their sources. And especially, I mean, from the minds of people who know that. So you basically you have to choose. If you want to hide, you have, you have to hide very systematically. And it's very hard these days. So that's all. And you know, somebody is looking at us for all the time, either we are hiding or not. So thanks.